So let's move on to some of the relevance of all of this. We've been thinking about osmolality, things dissolved in water. What does this have to do with physiology? Well, it turns out that it's really, really critical actually. So if you imagine some cells and those cells are placed in different sorts of solutions, um, that's going to influence which what, what happens in terms of the water flow, the osmosis into or out of the cell. So tonicity, this is a word that is probably a little bit more familiar. Osmolality was probably a new thing, but tonicity, this is probably review. And the reason that tonicity does what it does is because of the osmolality that we just described. So tonicity, okay, let's come back over to this slide and, and review a couple of things. Three different types of um, tonicities for solutions that we that we typically encounter. An isotonic solution, this means that um, the driving force for osmosis is the same in as it is out, so water movement just kind of happens equally in both directions. If, on the other hand, we are dealing with a hypotonic solution, if we take this red blood cell and place it into a hypotonic solution, this is saying the solution is low in dissolved solutes. Okay, so there are not very many solutes out here. Um, there are probably more solutes dissolved inside of the cell. So what's water going to do? Water is going to move to where there are more solutes. Water will move into this cell. And of course, that could be a problem. If water keeps moving in, this cell eventually will burst. And that's a problem. So think like uh, for a person who is on an IV, okay, the solution in the IV, that solution needs to be very carefully monitored and maintained. The, sol the solution concentration of the IV needs to be just right. Otherwise, this is gonna cause huge problems for the patient. This could cause their red blood cells literally to burst. So you would never do an IV of just pure water. Rather, it's always gonna be an IV with, with something dissolved in it. The blood plasma, we know the osmolality of blood plasma, that can be measured. It's, um, it's the same as a 0.3 molal glucose solution, and that's the same as a 0.15 molal NaCl solution. So those are solutions that are isoosmotic. Normal saline is 0.9 grams of NaCl dissolved in 100 mils of water. Um, another another typical IV solution would be a 5% dextrose solution. That's going to have the same osmolality as blood plasma as well. So this is something that becomes really relevant in healthcare. And just to wrap this all up, the other extreme is possible too. If we were to put a red blood cell in a solution that is hypertonic, so something that's either really salty or really sugary, then what that's going to do is draw the water out of the cell and cause the cell to shrivel up. This is called crenate. The cell crenates in that case. So thinking about the plasma, the blood plasma and homeostasis, so not necessarily in the context of an IV, but just in terms of normal human physiology, how is the plasma concentration normally maintained? How is homeostasis maintained for the blood plasma? Let's look at a couple of examples here. We know that the blood osmolality has to be maintained within a very narrow range, right? That blood osmolality needs to match up with the osmolality inside of the cells. Otherwise, there will be problems. So how is this accomplished in the body? Let's consider an example. Let's suppose that somebody starts to get dehydrated. This could be caused by a number of different ways. Either maybe they weren't drinking enough water or maybe they've been exercising strenuously. And some, in some way, they start to get dehydrated. So what that means inside of the body is that the blood volume will actually drop. There will be a decrease in the amount of blood flowing through the body. And in turn, what that means is the osmolality of the blood plasma increases because there's less water present. All the same solutes are still there, there's just less water. So osmolality increases. The thing that, can, that detects that change is the hypothalamus. This is uh, an amazing center in the brain that we'll be spending some time on together. The hypothalamus can detect a lot of different things in the body. And specifically, in this case, it detects the change in osmolality. So literally, there are osmoreceptors, um, receptors in the hypothalamus that detect osmolality. And that is going to cause the hypothalamus to activate a few things. Okay, for one, it's going to make you feel thirsty. And so you will tend to go and drink some water. And of course, that's going to help to solve the problem. If you increase your water intake, that's going to end up increasing your blood volume and help to bring things back to normal. 
But the other thing that's going to to take place or as a result of the hypothalamus's actions is that it will cause an antidiuretic hormone to be secreted from another part of the brain. So what this hormone will do is travel through the blood and go and act on the kidneys. It'll cause the kidneys to, to hold back more water. So essentially the person will not make as much urine. Uh, there will be less urine being produced. And that also is helping, going to help to increase the blood volume. So both of those things put together help to bring things back to normal. And that is essentially a negative feedback loop, right? Once things go back to normal, then the signal is gonna be turned off, the osmoreceptors will no longer be activated, and these pathways will no longer be on. So that's a great example of homeostasis in the context of blood plasma and maintaining osmolality 